love me and obey my commandments, I will ask the Father and he will give you another character to be with you always. That's quite a promise from Jesus. Using hindsight, we can discern the promised presence of the Holy Spirit as he formed the living body of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Church, in the state of Arkansas. Being infinite in wisdom, even prior to his first bishop, the Spirit sent primarily French priests to the area. <laughs> Father Jean Gravier celebrating the first Mass in Arkansas in 1700. The first priest assigned to work in Arkansas, Father Nicholas Procal, died a martyr at the hands of the segment of the Qualpon Indians to whom he had ministered. 143 years after that first Mass, the Pope created the Diocese of Little Rock in 1843. And in the following year, named its first bishop, Bishop Andrew Byrne, a native-born Irishman, the pastor of St. Andrew's Church in New York City, and thus began the Irish Ecclesiastical Delegate. <laughs> <laughs> the task before him was gigantic. But with Irish tenacity, faith, the love of the church, Bishop Byrne traversed the state on footback and on horseback all through 1845, a trip that unearthed nearly 700 Catholics spread throughout the entire territory of Arkansas. It's difficult to imagine what Bishop Byrne must have had endured in this state referred to by his French contemporary as, and I quote, a suburb of hell. <laughs> By November 1846, the good bishop had built the first of the cathedral of St. Andrew at Second and Center Streets, even though he wrote at that time to a friend, well, I do not need to go back to New York. I do not wish to stay in my diocese. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, however, does not guide the progress of the church, nor its consequent salvation of souls upon the likes or dislikes, the preferences or the aversions of its clergy. To Bishop Byrne's eternal credit, he struggled on, planting the seeds of Catholicism in a state that had become increasingly anti catholic one of the greatest achievements was going back to Ireland and bringing with him four sisters and five costumes of the recently formed Order of the Sisters of Mercy. They arrived in 1851. Their nuns had been a strategic part in the continued plan of the Holy Spirit for the church in Arkansas, through their hospitals, through their schools, now for 163 years. In 1862, Bishop Byrne died, and another, would you guess it, native-born Irishman, <laughs> Father Patrick Riley, was made administrator of the diocese, a position he held for five years, partially during the Civil War. And I thought I had it bad too. <laughs> <laughs> Until the second bishop, of course, another Irishman, Edward Fitzgerald, who had at first declined the Pope's invitation <laughs> to the Archbishop, and then the Pope made him an offering he could not refuse. He sent him a letter, Mandalas, we command. <laughs> Can you imagine nobody wanted to go to Arkansas? <laughs> he had only six priests in the entire diocese. God, the 
care for the flock that had been entrusted to him. But the Irish were not easily deterred, as you may have noticed. He built churches, increased the number of clergy, overcame enormous obstacles, worked through his own chronic depression to serve the church in the diocese. He even built and consecrated the cathedral which we are now in, in 1881, 133 years ago. The Holy Spirit always had us know the last time. The priest, the bishop who did not wish to come here, who pleaded not to come here, served our diocese for almost 40 years. <laughs> He also made critical financial decisions and land acquisitions, which would fund much of the work done by his eventual successors. Now, I don't know what happened in 1947. A non-Irishman, in fact, an Archie, became the fourth bishop of the world. As you know, the power of the Holy Spirit worked even there. He was gentle, kind, folksy. Actually got behind the rear end of the mule and planted vegetables so that during World War II the seminarians might be fed. He steered the helm of the ship when words like obedience and authority became bad words socially, politically, educationally, even ecclesiastically. And in what must have been the saddest duty of his life. Bishop Fletcher had to close St. John's Home Mission Seminary in 1967. Guiding the church as a bishop, as all of these good bishops could tell you, often means enduring pain and misunderstanding. In the wake of Vatican II, the diocesan see was uneasy with conflict and turmoil. Bishop Fletcher realized what St. Paul wrote in that second reading was true. It was God who had passed judgment as to whether he had been trustworthy as an administrator or not, and nothing else mattered. His successor would learn the same lesson. It was in 1972 that Andrew J. McDonald, the fourth Irishman out of five bishops, was named the Bishop of the Diocese of the Lord. The Spirit called him to leave the security and the comfort zone of, un of being surrounded by parishioners, loving family that we have with us today, and brother priest in Savannah, Georgia, who loved and admired him, to become a bishop where he was an unknown. And frankly, as I referred to him once in his 25th anniversary, thought of by many as being an interloper. He entered, as I would imagine every bishop did at that time, an ecclesiastical war zone, where those who expected too little and those who expected too much out of Vatican II came squared off against one another. The grandeur and the triumphalism that had once accompanied the office of bishop was on its last step. What essentially remained were the problems and the challenges that were always a part of being a bishop from Peter on. He made me aware of the change. When I met him outside this cathedral for the first time on September the 7th, 1972, and I started to genuflect to kiss his ring, a sign of my reverence for him and for his office. And he immediately pulled me up and with a little hint of admonishment in his eyes, uh, told me what would be his trademark. Trademark, a little joke. Uh, and I knew at that time 
that the paradigm of the church and the paradigm of what it means to be a bishop, well, the times were changing. Here was a priest sent by the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into the diocese of the Lord, to implement the changes in the vision of Vatican II in a diocese in a state known for our conservatism in, well, in almost everything. For 400 years, the little had changed in the universal church, its approach to spreading and living the gospel and the administration of the section. And frankly, that's the way most of us old guys like it. And along came Bishop Andrew J. McDonald with a big bag full of ideas. Uh, they were actually the ideas of the church. About changing altars around, the use of the vernacular, reconciliation rooms, inclusiveness, shared responsibility, catechesis, the educational system, liturgical changes, and on and on and on. We argued, thought he'd stop preaching and gone to men in the church. <laughs> the design of the Spirit becomes more obvious in sending this strong, intelligent, hard headed, stubborn Irishman, capable of holding his ground and standing up for what he knew was right for our church, right for the sheep he was sent to shepherd. And what he knew in his heart was the will of God, as expressed through the authority of the church that he served and that he loved. Because of that, he was willing to endure the reticent, even at times the ugly and disrespectful, attitude of those he was trying to lead to Jesus Christ. He chose God's will over personal popularity. On his arrival in the diocese, Bishop McDonald stated, With God's help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I will live and, if necessary, I will die to prove that I care, to prove that I love. Those were not empty words. The motto on his invisible coat of arms said, In Ave, Proofs. Well, there were times that some of us felt that he was the proof. <laughs> but as it turned out, in reality, the cross was the one that he bore. So courageous in order to lead our diocese closer to the Lord Jesus Christ during the time of turmoil and disorder. It is remarkable how the Spirit uses the experiences of our lives, informing us to be instruments in the hands of salvation. Being one of 12 children, taught Bishop Andrew that the good of the whole can only be achieved through the efforts of many. As Jethro advised his son-in-law Moses in the first reading to appoint others so that his task might not overwhelm him, and just as Jesus called the original Andrew to follow him, Bishop McDonald used the concept of shared responsibility that he had experienced in his own family to continue the work of Jesus Christ in our midst. He enlisted the aid of the clergy, religious, laity, to address the needs of the diocese. While the, in the past, governance of our church had been in the hands of the bishop and a few small number of people in the diocesan level, Advisory boards were now formed, touching every segment of diocesan life. The exodus of the clergy, amounting to a loss of 22% in our diocese between 1965 and 1990, was addressed through a presbyteral council, clergy welfare boards, personnel board, continuing education, a vibrant vocations department, St. John's Manor for retired priests, and a more receptive ear to the needs of the clergy. The burden caused by the shortage of priests was lightened when Bishop McDonald instituted a program for the formation of permanent deacons who have since served with humility and dedication in our institutions, parishes, and even within the diocesan staff. The religious education of the laity saw enormous growth 
as Catholics were actually encouraged to, guess what? Open the Bible, read it, study it, pray it. The Little Rock Scripture Study Program was instituted which spread beyond our diocese throughout our country and was translated into many diverse languages to be used across the globe. The Curcio Movement, Marriage Encounter, Pre Dana, Red Revive, Renew, Call to Action, the Charismatic Movement became just a part offered for the help of our laity to know, love, and serve Almighty God. Having four sisters who were nuns, the welfare of religious women was always his top priority for Bishop McDonald. And just as Bishop Byrne brought the mercy over to Arkansas, Bishop McDonald invited now Blessed Mother Teresa to bring her missionaries of charity to Abba House, a place where unwed mothers and women in need might find a home. That, however, was only a part of his efforts in favor of the protection of the life of the unborn. He established Birthright, St. Joseph's Workers, the annual pro life march in January, and he was always there at the front of the march, rain or shine, snow, whatever, to pray and draw attention to the dignity of the life of the unborn. Bishop McDonald's compassion was further evidenced in his care for the Vietnamese, who came to our diocese with the fall of South Vietnam and the Latinos who came in search of a better life for their families, and through his encouragement of Father Joe Biltz as he sought peace and justice. To mention all the accomplishments of this bishop in 28 years would have me forcibly convicted from this pulpit. And <laughs> some of you may be awakened by the story of some of the clergy. <laughs> Without him, there would not be sufficient clergy to serve the church. He had the foresight and the aid to enlist the aid of both religious orders and our wonderful Nigerian priests. Without him, there would be few diocesan offices or programs. We would lack sufficient funds to educate our 40 or so seminarians, praise God. And um, funds for retired priests, personal interest there. <laughs> <laughs> or an enhanced and expanded St. John's Catholic Center, the hub of Catholic life for our diocese. When I was honored to serve as administrator of this diocese, I discovered how absolutely remarkable the diocesan staff that Bishop McDonald and his symbol really was. Bishop McDonald had three secretaries over the years that enabled him to be what he was as our ordinary and our beloved bishop. Martha McNeil, Liz Parker, and Mary Grant Swift should all be awarded some of those honorary minors <laughs> for all that they did in the name of Jesus Christ through Bishop McDonald. Nostalgically, we will remember Bishop, or Bishop McDonald for his Irish wit, his little sheepish smile, his absolutely horrid jokes. <laughs> <laughs> The halfway he would give his
Sunday home. We have in confirmation too. We got a confirmation. <laughs> oh, the saints said, well, let me try your God the saints. <laughs> in finishing up the dinner by offering all his guests a taste of Fernet Brown, an absolutely horrible <laughs> Italian food, just so that he could see the pain on the table. <laughs> and of course, above all else, we remember his wonderful horse laugh, which I thought about, you know, trying to mimic, but it was not come <laughs> this loving priest, this caring bishop, essentially brought peace to our diocese. We, while we Marquis had to sniff around for a while, make sure he was the genuine article. He won us over a big time. Yes, he became beloved and respected by laity, religious, clergy, because he kept his promise. To show by his service that he loved us and that he cared about us. Oh, perhaps he didn't always say the right decision or say the right word like you and I always do. <laughs> but he, doesn't, that, doesn't, doesn't that simply underscore the fact that I'm trying to understand? that it was really the work of the Holy Spirit who used imperfect instruments all of our bishops, including Andrew J. McDonald, as links in his plan to strengthen the life of Jesus Christ among us. The remains of Byrne, Fitzgerald, Horace, Fletcher, and now McDonald will rest together in this crypt links in a chain formed by the Holy Spirit for your salvation and mine. The Spirit carried on His work among us, today Peter Sarton, who is today, and now Archbishop of Seattle, who shared His wisdom, kindness, and guidance with us like kind of a shooting star here and then gone. <laughs> heart and themes are so in line with those of His Holiness, Pope Francis, that we know without confusion, without doubt, the direction of our church. And that living out the gospel of Jesus Christ compels us to care for the needs of Jesus Christ in the poor and the defenseless. There's a line from Shakespeare's Macbeth, spoken by Mel of his father, King Duncan. Nothing became him as much as the leading of it. Regardless of his multitudinous accomplishments as our bishop, nothing became Bishop Andrew J. McDonald like leaving his mitre and crozier behind and humbly serving the sick and the dying with the little sisters of the poor in Palatine, Illinois. It is their request, I spoke to them last night, that you pray for locations for them <laughs> so that that wonderful work may continue in the presence of Christ among them. The responsibilities and crosses of the Episcopacy formed, have served to form a good, simple, humble, joyful, and loving priest of God in Andrew J. McDonald, who still desire to live and die in such a manner to prove that he cared and loved. Now, let your servant go in peace for your word and the promise of the Spirit 
lit for Andrew J. McDonald is over. Easter has begun.